Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Mike Emanuel, in for Shannon Bream. We begin with this Fox News alert. The political crisis in Virginia worsening yet again tonight. Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax facing a second allegation of sexual assault. He says it's all just a vicious, coordinated smear campaign, but tonight the alleged second victim's attorney is speaking out and a Virginia Democratic delegate introduced articles of impeachment, all the late-breaking details in a moment. Plus, brand new criticisms of Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's progressive new Green New Deal. Easy for me to say. And they are not from Republicans. Even President Obama's former energy secretary is calling the plan impractical. More on the cracks within the Democratic Party later. And stick around to the end of the hour. A Duck Dynasty star is here. He's got a new book out. Has America lost touch with its core values? Phil Robertson will answer that question. But first, let's go to Richmond and correspondent Ellison Barber with all the late-breaking details in Virginia's worsening political crisis. Good evening, Ellison. Good evening to you, Mike. Duke University tells me that they have asked Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax to step down from the Board of Visitors at Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. This after a woman came forward claiming the now Lieutenant Governor raped her in 2000 at Duke University when they were both students. The law firm representing Ms. Meredith Watson says Mr. Fairfax's attack was premeditated and aggressive and that, quote, Ms. Watson shared her account of the rape with friends in a series of emails and Facebook messages that are now in our position, possession. They then went on to say, quote, we have statements from former classmates corroborating that Miss Watson immediately told friends that Mr. Fairfax had raped her. In a statement, the lieutenant governor said, quote, I deny this latest unsubstantiated allegation. It is demonstrably false. I have never forced myself on anyone ever. I demand a full investigation into these unsubstantiated and false allegations. A couple of hours after those two statements, there was a Another one from the accuser's lawyers. They say the lieutenant governor is trying to smear their client and told reporters about a different assault, an assault they claim the lieutenant governor used to justify his alleged actions. According to the statement, in 2000, Ms. Watson ran into Mr. Fairfax one time after this alleged assault occurred. Ms. Watson asked Mr. Fairfax, why did you do it? And he answered, I knew that because of what happened to you last year, you'd be too afraid to say anything. Two women have accused the lieutenant governor of two different sexual assaults. Dr. Vanessa Tyson says he forced her to perform oral sex on him in a hotel room during the 2004 DNC convention in Boston. The lieutenant governor says that encounter was consensual. Countless Democrats have now called on the lieutenant governor to resign. One Virginia delegate says if the lieutenant governor fails to step down, he will introduce articles of impeachment on Monday. I believe these women. Impeachment shall be for a high crime or misdemeanor. There's no question that violent sexual assault clearly qualifies as a high crime. I would hope that no member would stand in the way of this process getting underway. My hope, my sincere hope, is that this will not be necessary. All of this, as Fox News learns, the governor told senior staff he will not resign over that racist yearbook photo, despite the calls for him to walk away. The governor also sent an internal email to government employees today apologizing for causing what he described as a distraction. Mike? Ellison Barber leading us off in Richmond. Ellison, many thanks. So the top three Virginia Democrats are all engulfed in potentially career-ending scandals, but all of them are refusing to resign, at least for now. And joining me now, former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock. It's great to see you. Good evening. Is it only a matter of time before Lieutenant Governor Fairfax is gone? Yes, and, and I wanted to mention, um, you know, I also served in the State House for five years. So this is very distressing for everybody in Richmond and for what is a very small community in the State House. We have something called the Virginia Way where we really work together. And I'd like to also point out that when these allegations first came forward, particularly about the second woman in October of 2017, this was before the election. And so that means there were people who knew about this, who ignored these things. And this is, both of these women appear to be, I think both of them are, uh, Democrats, who a lot of Democrat activists and people knew. And she came forward, they, they both came forward and had no reason to harm a fellow Democrat, yet they're 
cases were ignored. So it's very troubling. I think I, I am happy that other Virginia leaders have now called for him to step aside. I certainly, I, I certainly said that before they did. But I also think this needs to be looked into. I mean, if Justin Fairfax wants people to, you know, to, wants people to look at this more closely, I think we should. And I think we should find out who knew about this and when they knew about it, because th this is the kind of thing that if it had come out in October of 2017, the same time that Harvey Weinstein's allegations came out, right. this would have had an impact on the election, and Justin Fairfax would never have been elected, and our Commonwealth wouldn't be hurting like this and going through this. Is it your sense that the second accuser, Meredith Watson, is likely to seal Justin Fairfax's fate? Well, I think so, but it's not just these two women that I think have given credible, corroborated stories you know, with contemporaneous witnesses, but many Democrat activists and, and people are involved with helping them. Justin Fairfax doesn't seem to have many, if any, Democrats who are uh, out there defending him, which leads me to ask, what did you know? Because it, it seems like they all turned on him pretty quickly. Now, these are all the same people who told uh, Governor Northam he needed to resign last weekend, right. and, and now he's hunkering down. It looks like what about Justin the governor? Fairfax may do the same. Congresswoman, what about the governor? Do you think he's going to be able to hang on to his office? Well, I certainly think, as so many of, them have, uh, so many of the Democrats have said, they have no confidence in him. How can they believe him? And, you know, just this week there were reports saying the governor and the governor's wife were calling, you know, Justin Fairfax and his wife and, and, the other, and, and, and Mark Herring, who also had his own uh, blackface incident, and telling him, hang in there, you know, hunker down. So, unfortunately, it seems like they're all looking at political expediency, and it's at the expense of what are their own allies and their own... Th these were women who worked with their cause and helped them and they swept that aside for political expediency, and, and that's really was distressing. Former as well as, I mean, these were violent crimes, and they, and, and I think, you know, some of these, if, if these are true, the statute of limitations has not expired also. So if these are true and he wants them investigated, there could be criminal consequences as well. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Former Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. First, it was Republicans criticizing Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's progressive Green New Deal. But tonight, we have brand new criticisms from Democrats as some clear party divisions are emerging. Correspondent Jillian Turner is following the latest. Good evening, Jillian. Good evening to you, Mike. So Democrats on Capitol Hill are getting busy adopting the Green New Deal as the rallying cry of the 116th Congress. Our planet is in peril, and we need to be bold. And I think the challenge is out there, and I think the green generation is ready to politically fight for it. The deal's just a day old, but already generating major buzz and controversy. The centerpiece of the deal is aspirational, the elimination of fossil fuel emissions. But it doesn't stop there. It's also laced with proposals to eliminate plane travel, beef, and provide universal jobs and paid vacations for all Americans. Republicans are thumbing their noses. It's quite, quite rich for uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez to point out the fact that we need to ruin our economy and uh, stop all air travel and stop all cars. That's obvious with this new Green Deal that has no chance of going anywhere. You want to make it harder for people to go visit their families on Christmas? You want to make electricity prices six, seven, eight times what they are now? And you say that you can connect with the average guy out there? It's a real problem. After yesterday's rollout, Democrats lined up around the block to sign on. So far, the list includes almost all of 2020's hopefuls. Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, and Kirsten Gillibrand. But today, some senior Democrats are following in Speaker Pelosi's lead and beginning to distance themselves. President Obama's energy secretary weighed in publicly, telling NPR the deal's impractical and Howard Dean, former chairman of the DNC, offered a cautionary tweet. We can propose the moonshot, and we should, but we also have to engage those who are not convinced or are frightened. The message today from Dean and other seasoned Democrats to the new and enthusiastic wing of their party is crystal clear. Don't alienate American voters the party will need to win over in 2020. Dean and others recognize the Green Deal will be a tough sell for working class voters in Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and may very well send them running. So a warning from the party's elders to keep their eyes on the 2020 prize.
Mike? Jillian Turner live here in Washington. Jillian, thanks a lot. You bet. Democrats in Virginia are now bracing for the 2020 fallout. The deepening political crisis is threatening to turn the Democratic state back into a battleground state. Time now for tonight's power panel. Syndicated columnist and author Michelle Malkin, the former Ohio Senate Democratic minority leader Capri Cafaro, and chairman of the American Conservative Union, Matt Schlapp. Great to have all of you tonight. Great to be Absolutely here. Absolutely happy to be here. Michelle, first of all, your reaction to the latest developments in Virginia and how many of these top three officials are going to be forced out? Well, they're going to wait it out. And I believe that this is not the time uh, to be depending on uh, short memories and new cycles that will rescue these people. They, the left has um, basically built its own ideological Pandora's box. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I think that there are a lot of us on the right who've seen so many of, of these tactics, the, the grievance card played against Republicans and conservatives who are indulging in a bit of schadenfreude now. And, um, and the thing is, even despite that, I, I do have to caution, as somebody who's been an investigative reporter who has dealt with false allegations for the last several years, that we have to be very careful about a bandwagon effect now and the timing of, of some of these accusations. It okay. is true that some of these accusations were apparently covered up by top Democratic officials. But whenever there's political expedience involved, yes, you have to answer, uh, ask the tough questions, and allegations have to be subjected to corroboration. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to put on the screen a tweet from Senator Tim Kaine calling on the lieutenant governor to go. And with that, I want to ask Capri, what about the latest allegations coming out against mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor Justice Fairfax? Justin Fairfax, is he done or should he be? Uh, I think that he is going to be on his way out. I mean, we are seeing a mounting uh, group of individuals on the Democratic side from former Governor Terry McAuliffe, who you just mentioned, Tim Kaine. We saw a laundry list of others. And, and, and frankly, even Justin Fairfax himself is saying, bring on an investigation. Now, here's what I say about this. Number one, Democrats have to be careful because there needs to be a level of consistency. There were a lot of battle cries during the Justice Kavanaugh hearings, right. now Justice Kavanaugh hearings, <laughs> sure. um, that, you know, if we say, if we take Take a step back now. We, we look duplicitous, and, and that's something politically to take into account. But I think that now where we're at at this point is that this is a huge distraction from governing the state of Virginia, from Ralph Northman all the way down to the attorney general and Justin Fairfax right in the middle. People that are sticking around right now, they are being selfish and looking at their own self-interest to try to, I mean, their political careers and their political um, reputation is already damaged. I say step aside, step down, let somebody govern. And if you want due process, these are actual potential crimes in the Commonwealth of Virginia or wherever the jurisdiction is, let the judicial process give you the due process, not the court of public opinion. Matt Schlapp, is a house cleaning yeah. coming at the top of the Virginia government structure, or should there be? Absolutely, there should be. Abs absolutely, I think there will be. I think what we're seeing is a fracturing of the coalition uh, that gave Democrats a lot of success in Virginia. Let's face it, what's happening at the national level, I don't call them the Democratic Party anymore. That's really not accurate. It's like a socialist Democratic Party. When you you see the Green New Deal, when you see uh, AOC talking about a 70 percent confiscatory income tax, and now you see this uh, kind of a disgusting uh, approach to late-term abortions and infanticide. And so let's go back to the very beginning of the Virginia scandals. Rape is disgusting. It's illegal. It should not be tolerated, of course. This all started with the governor of Virginia saying, and he's a pediatrician, he said that he knew. He knew exactly what happens in these cases. You keep the baby comfortable. After the birth of the child, you talk to the parents. And if the parents don't want to keep the child uh, alive, to quote Donald okay. Trump, you execute it. That is the beginning of this scandal, Mike. And that's very important, because that's one of the things in a southern state like Virginia that is fracturing even okay. a left-wing Democratic coalition. Michelle, what about the Green New Deal? Your thoughts on that and the impact it could have on Democrats going forward? It's impractical, it's fantastical, and it is dividing the elite of the Democrat Party from these progressive rabble-rousers, and I am enjoying popping my popcorn watching it all. There is one important and serious ideological point that I'd like to make, though, that you rarely hear, which is that these radical environmentalists who are putting forth these costly programs that are pipe dreams actually turn out to be the worst enemy of future generations of children, not only because 
because of the cost uh, that these fantastical things uh, will impose on future generations, but because most radical environmentalists are uh, subscribers to population control policies uh, that don't want children on the earth in the first place. Capri, your thoughts on the Green New Deal and the presidential hopefuls who were very quick to jump on it. In fact, right. take a listen to Cory Booker out on the stump today. Our planet is in peril, and we need to be bold. And when the planet has been in peril in the past, who came forward to save Earth from the scourge of, of Nazi totalitarian regimes? We came forward. Capri, your thoughts? Don't ever invoke Nazis and try to compare them to anything else. Right. Number one, okay? Like, rule number one, don't do that. Um, but I think that Cory Booker and the rest that have signed on to the Green New Deal are just looking to make sure that they can compete in the progressive space in a, in a Democratic primary. Uh, I am of the, you know, Howard Dean camp and, and the camp of the former energy secretary. As a former legislator of the state of Ohio, we were the first to do renewable portfolio standards. I supported that. We need to take some level of action, but I can also tell you that this is absolutely Absolutely, um, you know, it's it's not realistic. And if we want to have a real conversation about reducing greenhouse gases and cl and combating climate change, okay. let's be serious. Matt, getting rid of commercial aviation, yeah. fixing not or rebuilding every <laughs> building in the country, Come and on. paying those unwilling to work. Your this thoughts? My favorite thing is we're going to get rid of all fossil fuels. We're going to get rid of cars. We're going to get rid of planes. We're going to uh, just uh, use bicycles. And get on high-speed rail, and uh, what I, what I love, bike, I so love all I'm this idea that the only part of energy we'll have in our economy is electricity. How will we generate that electricity? These are the details they might have thought about before they went to uh, writing this piece of stupid legislation. By the way, I think Wind it is real. Solar. All right, power panel, Matt Capri, Michelle, thank you so much for being here on a Friday night. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. You bet. Fireworks on Capitol Hill today during the acting attorney general's final days at the helm of the Justice Department. Have you ever been asked to approve any request or action to be taken by the special counsel? Mr. Chairman, uh, I see that your five minutes is up, and so uh, I'm, we, 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 I am here, I'm here voluntarily. I, we have agreed to five minute rounds. And, Chairman thought that was hilarious amid the contentious back and forth. The acting AG says he has not interfered in any way with the special counsel's Russia probe. Stick around for more on the hearing. Plus, the trade deal deadline with China is looming, and it's the day after the president's second scheduled summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. We're going to talk about it all with Illinois Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger after the break. President Trump's in very good health. That's the word from the president's physician who spent about four hours with the commander in chief for his second annual physical. Flexing the new majority muscle today, Democrats dishing out snarky comments, butting heads with the acting attorney general during a contentious hearing on Capitol Hill centering on the special counsel investigation. Correspondent Trace Gallagher has more now on the combative back and forth. Hello, Trace. Good evening, Mike. This was bound to be a battle because Democrats said repeatedly the only reason President Trump appointed Matt Whitaker as acting attorney general was to rein in the Robert Mueller probe. In fact, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Gerald Nadler, vowed that Whitaker would be their first witness. And today, right out of the gate, Whitaker was asked why, if he was critical of the Mueller probe in the past, did he not recuse himself from the investigation? Watch. There After were consulting career with EOJ officials who advised you that you should not touch that investigation. Isn't that correct? Congressman. Yes or no? I consulted with career ethics officials. I consulted with my senior staff. I consulted with the Office of Legal Counsel. It was my decision to make. I decided not to recuse. Whitaker was also asked if he shared any of Mueller's report with the president or his legal team, and if he supported the president's claim that the investigation is a sham. I have not talked about the special counsel's investigation with senior White House officials. Are you overseeing a witch hunt? Congressman, as I've mentioned previously, the special counsel's investigation is an ongoing investigation, and so I think it would be inappropriate for me to... But you wouldn't oversee a witch hunt, would you? You'd stop a witch hunt, wouldn't you? Congressman, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to talk about an ongoing investigation. 
Perhaps the most contentious exchange came when Whitaker called time on Chairman Nadler, which caused some to laugh, others to gasp. Look. Have you ever been asked to approve any request or action to be taken by the special counsel? Mr. Chairman, uh, I see that your five minutes is up, and so um, <laughs> I'm... We, 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 I am here, I'm here voluntarily. I, we have agreed to five-minute rounds. After the hearing, Nadler told reporters they might need to speak to Whitaker again since he didn't answer many of the committee's questions, though Whitaker's continued tenure as AG is likely less than a week. Mike. Trace, thank you. Breaking tonight, President Trump tweeting the location for his second summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The leaders will be meeting in Hanoi, Vietnam on February 27th and 28th, which is just one day before the deadline for a trade deal with China. Issues that are both of huge importance for the president's legacy and the nation's economic and foreign policy. But with the clock ticking down, is there enough time to hammer out all the details? Let's bring in Republican Congressman from Illinois, Adam Kinzinger, who sits on the House Foreign Relations Committee. Congressman, great to see you. Hey, good to see you. President Trump tweeting this evening, writing, North Korea under the leadership of Kim Jong-un will become a great economic powerhouse. He may surprise some, but he won't surprise me because I've gotten to know him and fully understand how capable he is. North Korea will become a different kind of rocket, an economic one. What's your reaction to that from President Trump? I, look, I want to be clear about something. Kim Jong-un is a very evil person. He has killed a lot of people. He keeps people in work camps. And the whole reason we're in this position is because he's trying to develop a nuclear weapons program. So I'm always uncomfortable when the president compliments him. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think this is going to be a good summit, I hope. Uh, you know, one, one thing we have to keep in mind when the whole Iranian nuclear deal was being hammered out, I didn't like the deal, but that was all behind closed doors, and then we just saw what it looked like in the end. This process with North Korea plays out in public, so there's going to be ups and downs in this. There's going to be, like, high moments and low moments. I hope that on February 27th we can get some good progress, but I think we're going to need to see some pretty certifiable progress here soon if we want to get off of a war path with uh, North Korea. Yeah, that summit in Hanoi is just about two and a half weeks away. Any sense of how much they need to figure out before Trump, Kim 2.0? Well, it's probably a lot to figure out. I know but there's been a lot of negotiations behind the scenes. I've gotten briefed on where they're sitting on some of them. There's a lot of work being done. Uh, so it's one thing to kind of map out where we want to go from here. Here's some deliverables we can walk out with. But what I am concerned with, and I think needs to be very clear, is it's time for some deliverables. I worry that we're going to pull troops out of South Korea. I worry that we're going to declare an end to the Korean War and start giving all these things without getting something that's verifiable and certifiable. I think President Trump is doing the right thing on this path because I think the alternative is really bad and we have to do everything we can. But it is time for Kim Jong-un to give us some certifiables besides that he's just not shooting missiles around. Michael O'Hanlon from Brookings suggests the president should get pragmatic. He should do a deal that eliminates North Korea's ability to produce more bombs as well as longer range missiles in exchange for a partial lifting of sanctions. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, I mean, there's stuff I'm uncomfortable with any kind of a deal like that because it means we're going to have to give something to a very evil man. And I think it's, again, incumbent on us to remember he's a very evil man. But in reality, there's going to be some give. And I think the president's point about, hey, the North Korean economy can be good if they come to a footing of peace instead of war, I think is possible. There's got to be some carrots in this, but it's also got to be clear that there's sticks, which is we have a lot of troops near North Korea. We have the ability to destroy North Korea's nuclear weapons, but we'd much rather see North Korea on a path to peace and prosperity, right. helping its people, pulling them out of work camps, than the alternative. All right, in our final moments here, we're a week out from another funding deadline. Here we go again. What are you hearing from your friends and colleagues involved in the talks? Are we going to get a deal? I think we are. I think it's going to end up being something where probably nobody's happy, but everybody's happy. It'll be one of those things. I think we're not going to shut down. It seems like the Democrats are giving a little bit from what I'm hearing. We're probably going to have to give a little bit. And ultimately, we're not going to shut the government down because we shouldn't. We need to build some wall. We need to get border security. I think we're on the path. But I'd be, look, I'm an optimist. And about 87 percent of the time, my optimism's wrong. So who knows? Well, hopefully you're right this time. Congressman Adam Kinzinger from so. the great state of Illinois, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. You bet, see ya. 
Amazon CEO claims he was being extorted and blackmailed by the National Enquirer, so Jeff Bezos is fighting back. We've got the latest on this tawdry tabloid tale, and we'll discuss the legal ramifications of this case. Then a little bit later, Fox News at Night meets Duck, Duck Dynasty when Phil Robertson and his beard stop by. Keep it here. The richest man in America, Amazon's chief executive, Jeff Bezos, is accusing the National Enquirer of trying to blackmail him over explicit photos of him sent to his mistress. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Correspondent Leland Vittert has the story tonight. Good evening, Leland. Good evening, Mike. And as you noted, beyond the accusations by Bezos, American media, which owns the National Enquirer, now faces questions by the Justice Department. If they violated their agreement with the feds, we'll start at the beginning and work our way to this point. The National Enquirer ran a story about the Amazon founder's alleged affair, complete with steamy text between Jeff Bezos and his lover. The world's richest man then launched his own investigation into how the tabloids got the pictures and looking into whether the National Enquirer's longtime friendly relationship with President Trump had anything to do with their motivations. Now Bezos has released emails from American media which owns the Enquirer, threatening to publish compromising photos of him, including, quote, below the belt selfies, unless he drops his investigation. And, quote, there's an acknowledgement from the Bezos parties released through a mutually agreeable news outlet affirming that they have no knowledge or basis for suggesting that AM's coverage was politically motivated. Bezos fought back, writing, rather than capitulate to extortion and blackmail, I've decided to publish exactly what they sent me, despite the personal cost and embarrassment they threatened. Federal prosecutors say David Pecker, publisher of The Inquirer, paid a woman to kill her story, claiming an affair with President Trump before taking office. Trump's also attacked Bezos for his ownership of The Washington Post and its coverage of him. But today, the White House was silent. We're not going to get into a conversation about something between Jeff Bezos and a tabloid magazine. Well. The New York Post, though, had this to say, Bezos exposes Pecker, a reference to the type of pictures the Inquirer allegedly had. From the New Yorker's John Cassidy, memo to the honchos at the National Enquirer, if you're going to threaten one of the world's richest men by saying that you have sexually explicit selfies of him and his girlfriend, don't have your lawyer and top editor put the threats in writing. Worth noting tonight, it's still unclear how the National Enquirer obtained both the racy pictures and steamy texts between Bezos and his girlfriend in the first place. They did put out a statement, though, saying that they fervently believe, Mike, that they acted lawfully in their reporting. Quite a story. Leland Vetter, live tonight in Washington. Leland, thanks a lot. Let's take a closer look at the legality of the situation with tonight's legal eagles, criminal defense attorney Andrew Cherkasky and former chief counsel to Senate Majority Leader Alex Vogel. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Good so evening. the richest man in the world evidently sent compromising photos of himself to his mistress and they end up in the hands of the National Enquirer. Is American media in deep trouble, Andrew? Oh, absolutely. You know, when you mess with the U.S. attorneys and try to make them look foolish for the deal that they had cut four months ago, you're in big trouble. I mean, when you cut a deal, not only is it uh, the sort of thing where it's you've got to abide by the law of the deal itself, you've got to continue to abide by the law. And if you so much as jaywalk, you're in big trouble. Take a listen to Stephanie Cutter, who worked for President Obama, and then I'll get you to respond, Alex. I've certainly had plenty of encounters with the National Enquirer, and, and I, I'm a strong defender of the First Amendment, but I think it, it's a stretch to, to call that journalism. Right. So, and, and, and I know, also think they started to panic once the strings started to pull and Bezos called their bluff. Your reaction to that? Uh, so look, there's an old expression in Washington, uh, don't uh, pick a fight with a guy who buys ink by the barrel. Ironically, we have two guys here, uh, uh, Pecker and Bezos, who buy ink by the barrel. The difference is uh, Bezos can also deliver the ink to your house within 12 hours. <laughs> Clearly, they picked the wrong fight. Um, it's also a new chapter that he's written in the top five, uh, shoot the hostage, uh, I won't negotiate with terrorists. Uh, look, this is not a First Amendment issue. Uh, 
Um, uh, I've heard arguments that they believe they were operating, uh, they, AMI, was, was engaged in journalistic activity. That's a stretch. That's not journalism. Um, I've also heard arguments that, well, this doesn't meet the classic statutory definition of extortion. Um, I'll concede it's not the normal case. Usually right. it's a threat in exchange for money. Um, that being said, if I was a prosecutor, uh, I'd dig down pretty hard on this, and I think they actually uh, are in a great deal of jeopardy. And again, that's before we get to the issue of how they actually acquired these texts and pictures. I'm pretty right. sure that he didn't leave his phone unlocked on a park bench. And while, <laughs> ironically, the best case here is that someone gave them to him, the worst case is they engaged in some illegal activity. There have been allegations or rumors thrown around about government involvement. That would really blow this open. But even the more traditional ways to do this are likely legally problematic for them. Alex, is it shocking to you that Bezos fought back, speaking openly about this embarrassing incident? Look, most people don't. Um, and, and one of his arguments is he wants to turn this log over and see what comes out. I'm guessing what's going to come out, uh, in addition to the facts of this case, are a number of other instances where they've engaged in similar behavior. Um, and it is, frankly, as he said, um, his argument was if if I, the richest man in the world, can't do this, who can? Who can stand up right. to this? So I, I think there are a lot of people who are very, uh, very appreciative of that. Andrew, do you think the inquirer was going after Bezos as a political attack? Well, whether it's a political attack or not, they're going after him to get something in exchange for it. And that's what really matters. When you talk about extortion, it's a textbook law school test exam. When somebody tries to get something of value in exchange for not ruining their reputation, that's extortion. So whether it's political or not, now if you go into the depths of what's really going on here, you've got the actual uh, deputy general counsel who used to work for Amazon, the one who's sending those okay. emails. So is there something personal or is it something that's political? That's almost beside the point. It's extortion. All right, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Andrew, Alex, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Democrats control of the House may have a major impact on whether or not the government shuts down again in seven days because a major new rule change under the new speakers uh, impacts the deadline for when a bipartisan border security deal can get done. We're pretty close, but we're not closed. We're not that close. And a little bit later, Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty fame joins us for a compelling conversation about his life lessons he shares in his new book, the theft of America's soul, stick around. New optimism tonight for a compromise deal over border security funding, but the clock is still ticking to another possible government shutdown. And that's because there's a major change in the House this year, a new rule that members must post the text of bills a full 72 hours before a vote. Senior Capitol Hill producer Chad Pergram explains. Americans expect members of Congress to read what they're voting on, be it changes to the nation's health care system or a barrier along our southern border. You never know what's tucked deep inside that legislation. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi stoked the country's ire in 2010 as Congress stumbled toward approving Obamacare. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Republicans spied an opening. Read the bills became their mantra. Have you read the bill? Have you read the reconciliation bill? They blasted Democrats for President Obama's 1,132-page economic stimulus plan, a climate change measure clocked in at 1,200 pages. And this... is Obamacare. Have you read the manager's amendment? Yeah. Hell no, you haven't. Yeah. That same year, Republicans pledged to make a change, requiring three days to read bills if they won the House. Well, not quite. A closer reading of the GOP rule only mandated the House post some bills for parts of three days, sometimes described as a 24-hour and two-second rule. In other words, you could post a bill at 11.59.59 p.m. on a Tuesday, and vote as early as 12.00.01 on a Thursday. We need to do better. Uh, we need to restore some integrity to this institution, and that was the point of some of the changes in the rules package. Now that Nancy Pelosi has the gavel again, Democrats say they really will read the bills before they vote. 
The new rule says most garden variety bills must be available for all to peruse for a full 72 hours before debate and vote. I think it's just a, the, the fair way to proceed. People ought to know what they're voting on. When the House met in this room in the 19th century statuary hall of the Capitol, bills were only a page long, and there was only one copy. Some members were illiterate, so a House clerk read the bills out loud so everyone could hear the legislation. The House is supposed to do that today, but always waives that rule. In college, just because a professor assigns the book doesn't mean that students read it. And the same is the case with reading the bills in Congress. On Capitol Hill, Chad Pergram, Fox News. Okay, we've got a very special guest coming up next. Duck Dynasty star and author Phil Robertson spends some quality time with Shannon discussing the big issues. It's the age-old struggle between good God and evil, the devil. Has America lost touch with its core values? Duck Dynasty star Phil Robertson says yes, and he thinks in order to make America great again, we should start with God. Shannon Bream caught up with the Duck Dynasty patriarch, Shannon. Joining me now, Duck Dynasty star Phil Robertson. He's got a new book out, The Theft of America's Soul, Blowing the Lid Off the Lies That Are Destroying Our Country. Phil, great to have you with us. How the heck are you? Hey, good to, good to be with you, Shannon. Well, listen, uh, you know that this book uh, is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. And I know you're talking about the cultural fights and the issues there. And you go through the book and you talk about lies that were being presented in society and how you want to challenge them. So I thought we maybe throw a couple of those up and you can give us a little bit of your thoughts. The first one, God is dead. What's that about? Well, I've noticed that when human beings, uh, this started way back when I was in college, when human beings started saying that God dies and God is dead on them, I've just noticed that they're the ones, the humans are the ones who are dead. Like Ephesians 2, you once were dead in your sins and transgressions when you followed the ways of the world and the spirit of the kingdom of the air who works in those who are disobedient. So I'm just trying to remind people, God's always been, he always will be, all he asks us to do is love him and love each other. I don't see the downside to it, Shannon. Well, Phil, what do you say to people that they say this is so old fashioned that you would care about immorality or any of these issues? You mentioned the word sin. They don't, that doesn't come up here in DC a whole lot. <laughs> but a lot of people think this is just outdated uh, and the time for that's over. How do you respond? So you read the, read the definition of sin. Everyone who sins, and all do, breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Well, Shannon, if we can't look out at our culture and if we can't see lawlessness, what in the world would it take for us to see it? I mean, we're in the streets, we're hollering, immorality, murder, rape, robbery, mayhem. I mean, you would think people would look and say, you know, Phil, you've got a point. The Bible has a point. Uh, we don't seem to be very uh, loving. I mean, the Kavanaugh hearing, the way people went on and on and on in the attacks, and, I'm, and the, the language we use these days, I mean, the F word, that's gone mainstream. Mm -hmm. Perversion is mainstream. Immorality is mainstream. And we're suffering these debilitating diseases that come from all this stuff. But we just carry on and say, don't tell me anything about living a life of restraint, a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't tell me about those things, Phil, because those things, you know, that's that Bible stuff. I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, man, what in the world have we turned into? I never thought... I would see America look like it does now. I never thought I would see that while I was on the earth. Well, but I'm looking at it. I wrote the book to say at least investigate mm -hmm. one guy who's trying to for us just to do good when we get up in the morning. It's well, a tough sell. Well, it is a tough sell, but I think the I'm book is, is very interesting. You're the guy to do it, and I think it's going to spark a lot of interesting conversations if people will give it a chance and be willing to have those conversations. You mentioned forgiveness. 
I'd say I need it every single day, sir, and I know you would say the same for yourself. So we wish you the best and uh, come back soon. Time now for tonight's Midnight Hero. Six-year-old Abigail Arias has always dreamed of being a police officer, but doctors have told her she has incurable kidney cancer, so the police chief and the Freeport Police Department made her dreams come true. They swore in Abigail Arias as an honorary member of the force, and she promised to keep fighting the bad guys until all of her cancer is gone. We salute Abigail Arias, Chief Raymond Garavee Jr., and the Freeport Police Department as tonight's Midnight Heroes. Most trusted, most watched, and most grace grateful that you spent the evening with us. Happy Friday night. Good night from Washington. I'm Mike Emanuel, in for Shannon Bream.